So good evening and welcome to Copperfield's Books virtual event with Peter Richardson. My name's Jamie Madsen and I will be your host for the evening. So just a couple of things to note before we, we dive in. The format will feature between 35 to 45 minutes of speaking and will then be followed by a live Q&A. If you have any questions or comments for Peter tonight, go ahead and submit them under the Q&A icon, which is right at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Also keep an eye on your chat box tonight because I will be sharing discount codes and more information about tonight's title and, and all the other goodies that you'll need. So now I'm thrilled to introduce tonight's author. Peter Richardson has written critically acclaimed books about Hunter S. Thompson, The Grateful Dead, Ramparts Magazine, and radical author Carrie McWilliams. His essays have appeared in The Nation, Los Angeles Times Book Review, San Francisco Chronicle, and many more. Since 2006, Peter has taught courses on California culture at San Francisco State. Born and raised in the East Bay, he now lives here in Sonoma County. And he is with us tonight to discuss his latest title, Savage Journey, Hunter S. Thompson and the Weird Road to Gonzo. And I've had a lot of fun thumbing through this already. So I'm going to shut up and hand it straight over to you, Peter. Why don't you get us started? Thank you very much, Jamie. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it is. Uh, this is my local bookstore now, Copperfields. And uh, I'm in Glen Allen now, which as we'll see in a little in a little while is where Hunter S. Thompson lived for a short time. And tonight, I, I don't want to try to tell his whole story. I want to just kind of start uh, when he comes to the Bay Area and, and then go through his most productive years and, and maybe stop at around 1975 or so. So that, that feels a little bit more manageable, I think. And I'm assuming some of us know a little bit about Hunter Thompson, but even if you don't, um, we, should have a, we should have a kind of working knowledge of what he did what he accomplished in a, in a fairly short time. I mean, there was really one decade of really productive work. And uh, I also want to talk a little bit about gonzo journalism, which his creation, which was a kind of unique blend of political commentary, kind of over the top political commentary, satire, invective, uh, media criticism with a little hallucination thrown in for good measure. And that, that was really the style. He was a, a comic stylist in many ways. And that's what really set him apart from his peers and what really explains his continuing success. I mean, he still attracts large audiences. And of course, much of his work has been made in film and so on. I wanna talk a little bit about how he became the cultural celebrity that, that he became over half century ago, almost exactly half century ago. Uh, I also wanna talk a little bit about where it happened and who helped him create gonzo journalism? Because in many ways, that's, that's a Bay Area story. And uh, because Thompson lived the last four decades of his life in the Rocky Mountains, and he was from Louisville, as we'll see originally, uh, that the, the San Francisco piece kind of um, either gets overlooked or taken for granted. And I really wanna do a little bit more as the book does, I wanna do a little bit more of a slow walk uh, through his San Francisco years and then the immediate aftermath of that, which as I say, was his, was his most productive time. And then at the very end, I wanna make the argument that Thompson was the most distinctive American voice in the second half of the 20th century. So th those are the stakes that we're playing for tonight. Last, I wanted to um, make sure that you didn't have to look at my mouth moving for 45 minutes. So. So I brought together 10 images that I think will help us kind of see uh, what, what Thompson was doing and what his development looked like. And I'm gonna shift to that right now and see if we can kind of pull this off by sharing screens. Hope everybody can see that. Okay, yeah, so this is the name of my talk, I guess if it has a formal title, Hunter S. Thompson in 10 images. And with that, um, we'll just go ahead and get underway. This is the book cover, obviously, uh, which I love. I think it's one of the best covers I've seen in a while, certainly the best one of the books that I've published and they've been getting better, but I'm really pleased with the University of California Press and the cover um, they were able to put together. Great photograph by David Heiser, and then this um, fantastic type treatment. So we'll start at the beginning. 
This is Hunter S. Thompson in the Air Force in Florida. He was actually from Louisville, Kentucky originally. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it, it, it becomes important later. Uh, he grows up in Louisville, Kentucky, born in the 1930s and uh, doesn't go to college right out of high school. Instead, he joins the Air Force where he becomes a sports writer. That's also pretty important too, because he really, you know, the whole kind of shoe leather approach to journalism is not really his background. It really is more this kind of stylish, sporty, you know, jaunty prose that he, that he develops very early on. That starts in, 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 the, in the Air Force. Um, he also, while he's serving in the Air Force, he's also working for some local Florida newspapers, again, doing their, doing their sports and sports ed editorial. He, he sort of uh, travels around a little bit. He's in New York City for a little while. He, he drives cross country to deliver a, an automobile. And he ends up in the San Francisco Bay Area, which interests him because this is 1960 or so. Uh, he also spent some time in Puerto Rico by that time, writes a novel, is not able to get it published, comes across country, drops off the car in Seattle, hitchhikes to San Francisco. And he's attracted to San Francisco because, he, because of the beats, the beat literary movement with Jack Kerouac and uh, Allen Ginsberg and so on, a City Lights bookstore and Lawrence Ferlinghetti. And, um, you know, so he's looking for work in San Francisco, kind of poking around a little bit, applies for jobs at the San Francisco Chronicle and the San Francisco Examiner, doesn't get an offer. So he leaves and he goes to Big Sur, which is a very odd place to go if you're a journalist. It's kind of a remote coastal outpost, um, but it makes a little bit more sense if you are a kind of novelist in training, which is how he saw himself. And uh, there were some novelists in, in Big Sur, including, you know, of course, Kerouac sets one of his novels in Big Sur. Ferlinghetti had a cabin in Big Sur. But it's really Henry Miller, who's the big shooter down in, in, uh, in Big Sur at this time. Of course, Miller had written these um, um, novels in, in the 1930s in Paris. Most of them hadn't even been published in the United States because of their explicit sexual content. That was catnip for Thompson. He loved that part. So he goes down, he tries to meet Miller, it doesn't work out, but he ends up writing about Miller. And he, um, his first, yeah, his very first article in a national magazine is, is called Big Sur, The Tropic of Henry Miller. And it's a kind of uh, feature piece, magazine piece, um, about Big Sur at that time. And it's not well received locally. The people in Big Sur, including his landlady say, you know what, you don't really like what you said about it. Why don't you get, why don't you leave? So he bounces around a little bit more. He is a, a, a foreign correspondent for um, the National Observer, which is the weekend publication at that time for the Wall Street Journal. And uh, then he, he returns, this time married, to, to the Bay Area. And um, he's looking around for work. He doesn't really like the way it's going at the National Observer. Um, he wants to write about some things, including campus activism in Berkeley. They don't want him to do that. Uh, he wants to review a book by Tom Wolfe. They don't want him to do that. So he, he, he's starting to look for new outlets. And one of the places he queries is the Nation magazine, uh, which is edited at that time by Kerry McWilliams, who was an old kind of California guy. He was a, an attorney and an activist and an author, a radical uh, from Los Angeles. He's lured back to New York City to, to edit the Nation, but he suggests to Thompson, who's desperate for work, why don't you cover the uh, Hells Angels motorcycle gang? And Thompson thinks, wow, what a great idea. I'm gonna do that. And he does. And he rides with the Hell, meets the Hells Angels, gets some friends to introduce him, journalist friends. And he rides with them for two weeks, writes the article, and then um, submits it to the, to the nation. And on the strength of that article, he receives several book contract offers 
they want him to take the, the, the article and turn it into a book. And he signs a contract and, and he spends the next year embedded essentially with the Hells Angels, rides motorcycles with them, drinks in the bars that they drink at, goes on uh, Labor Day runs, long weekend runs with them. He doesn't you know, try to be mistaken for Hells Angels. He doesn't wear the patch, he doesn't wear their colors. He doesn't ride a Harley, but he does accompany them so that he can better report on them. And one of the things that's important, I think, about that is that it took a certain amount of physical courage for him to report on this story. Not every um, journalist or new journalist, as he came to be known, he and Tom Wolfe and Joan Didion were pioneering what was called at that time the new journalism. It was participatory reporting, it was told in the first person. And, you know, there was this, this sort of these elements of fiction really that, that get thrown in. And, uh, and Hell's Angels, the book, when it comes out is, is his first bestseller, it's his first book. And it's, it's a bestseller. And he becomes a kind of national figure on the strength of that book. He leaves um, the Bay Area even before the book comes out and he moves to his permanent home, what would become his permanent home, which is um, Woody Creek, which is just 10 miles outside of Aspen, Colorado. But he maintains his San Francisco contacts. And one of his most important contacts was this guy, Warren Hinkle, who at that time was editing a magazine called Ramparts, which wasn't around for very long. It was. A, 1962 to 1975, but it was a very important magazine. It was a, it was a kind of a breath of fresh air in many ways and published a lot of important political journalism with a kind of new left, slightly kind of countercultural position. They weren't hippies by a long shot, the people at, at Ramparts, but um, Hinkle had this great kind of irreverent iconoclastic um, attitude and he and Thompson really hit it off. And Thompson began working with Hinkle. Um, even after Hinkle left Ramparts, Thompson didn't write anything for Ramparts when Hinkle was there or ever actually. But Hinkle leaves Ramparts and starts a, a, a magazine called Scanlon's Monthly. And uh, Thompson does publish some, some pieces for them. One of which was this. The Kentucky Derby is decadent and depraved. And this is widely regarded as the first work of gonzo journalism. And um, for this story, remember Thompson is from Louisville, Kentucky. That's where, the, that's where the Kentucky Derby is held every year at Churchill Downs. So Thompson pitches this story idea to, to Hinkle and says, listen, I wanna, co I wanna cover the Kentucky Derby. Hinkle says, great idea. I'm going to match you with an illustrator. And uh, it's not Thompson's first choice. He wants a guy named Pat Oliphant, who was a political cartoonist. And uh, Oliphant can't do it. So uh, uh, Hinkle says, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put you with uh, a Welsh illustrator who happens to be in the United States right now. And his name is Ralph Steadman. And this is a really, really important moment in, in Thompson's um, career. So his magazine journalism has been faltering a little bit. He writes a story for Playboy magazine. They kill it and they don't like it. It offends one of their advertisers, Chevrolet, and uh, Hinkle runs it. And then, so this is his second piece that uh, Thompson is going to write for uh, Scanlon's and Hinkle but it's the first piece that has Ralph Steadman on it. And I think that that combination, uh, you know, Thompson's satire and then Steadman's satirical illustrations are really what make Gonzo distinctive. This is considered the first piece of Gonzo and uh, Thompson thinks it's, it's a brutal failure. He thinks he's completely screwed up the story. He has a hard time completing it he finally ends up faxing some of his raw notes to Hinkle, who kind of assembles them into this piece, puts them together with Stedman's illustrations. 
and it turns out to be an incredible success, much to Thompson's surprise. Later, Thompson would say, I, felt, I feel like I uh, fell down an elevator shaft and landed in a pool full of mermaids because that piece was so terrible and it had such great success. Now, he didn't realize right off the bat that it was going to become his most valuable literary asset. You know, he thought, wow, okay, I just got lucky. But he does want to work together. He's, he's smart enough to realize that he wants to work together with uh, Ralph Steadman. In fact, he knew he wanted to do that even before the piece was widely regarded as a breakthrough in, in American journalism. So he goes back to, to Hinkle and says, Lyson, I've got this idea. You know, this will be a series. We'll call it the Thompson Steadman Report. And um, you'll publish it in Scanlands and we'll go to the Super Bowl and we'll go to America's Cup and we'll go to Mardi Gras and it'll be fantastic. We'll just do what we did at the, at the Kentucky Derby, which was this crazy over the top kind of drunken or revelry really. He doesn't say a word about the race itself. He just focuses on all the debauchery that surrounds the, this annual event in, um, in Louisville. And he satires, satirizes rather his hometown mercilessly. And it's very funny. So he realizes that's, a, that's the formula for a whole series of things. Only problem is Hinkle's magazine goes out of business after only eight issues. So now Thompson is back at square one. He knows he wants to keep working with Stedman somehow, but he has to find a new outlet. And the new outlet turns out to also be located in San Francisco and it's Rolling Stone magazine. Now you probably know that Rolling Stone was, was uh, created just after the summer of love in 1967 in San Francisco. This is one of the co-founders right here, probably the most important one over the history, definitely the most important one over the history of the publication. This is Jan Wenner, who co-founds Rolling Stone magazine when he's only 21 years old. And, and that's in 1967. So now uh, the Kentucky Derby piece comes out in 1970. Thompson's looking for a new place to publish and he compliments Wenner on Rolling Stone's coverage of the Altamont rock concert, which happens in December of 1969. And Rolling Stone just hits it out of the park uh, with their coverage. I think they run 10,000 words on what went wrong at Altamont. Now you, you'll remember maybe that um, it's, it's at Altamont that, um, you know, all these, um, first of all, the Rolling Stones were there. I mean, <laughs> Rolling Stones were there. But the Hell's Angels were there, and uh, they're they're up in front of the stage, and they're just um, really stomping on on the hippies and and young people that are trying to press up to the stage to to hear the Rolling Stones and other bands. Um, of course, you know Thompson's already written about the Rolling Stones, so he's already interested in the story, and and then of course the 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 Hell's Angels kill a young black man named Meredith Hunter from Berkeley in right in front of the stage during the performance. And it's, it's just a, you know, debacle, disaster. And Rolling Stone covers that and they win their first national magazine award. And Thompson writes to a very young Jan Wenner and says, boy, you really did a great job. Wenner says, why don't you write, why don't, you know, why don't you write for the magazine? Let me know if you've got something that would be right for us. Hinkle says, okay, let me keep that in mind. Here's Thompson. This is him in 1970 in uh, Aspen, Colorado, when he decides to run for sheriff on the Freak Power ticket. I think he called it the, uh, the Mescaline platform. And, you know, he's got this kind of outlandish political platform. Um, it's not totally a prank, though. He's quite serious. In, in terms of running, almost wins the race for sheriff in Pitkin County, Colorado. And here he is bald, he, he was always balding, but here he has shaved his head. He said, you know, his opponent, the, the incumbent sheriff had a crew cut. So he decided to shave his head. And so that he could distinguish him himself from what he called my long haired opponent. And um, so this is him in 1970 running for sheriff. He decides to write about that, and that is the first article that 
that Thompson places in Rolling Stone magazine. No illustrations by Ralph Steadman, just a, a, you know, just this story. And uh, and he's you know he's off and away. He's not a typical Rolling Stone contributor. He's older. You know, he didn't go to college. Um, you know, he's a, he's an Air Force veteran. Uh, there's a lot of things that don't that don't uh, make him look like all the other contributors. But he quickly becomes. Rolling Stone's most popular writer on the strength of these kind of, uh, you know, uh, comical but but political uh, pieces that he, he begins to write. Now, one of his most famous pieces is Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. And um, I want to spend a minute just talking about how he came to write that piece. He actually was in Aspen, Colorado, as usual. And uh, this gentleman on the right side of the picture, Oscar Acosta, who befriended him in Colorado, goes to Los Angeles. He's a Chicano activist attorney. And he says, you should come to Los Angeles and cover what's happening here, cover the Chicano movement, specifically the death of a, of a Latino journalist named Ruben Salazar, who had written for the Los Angeles Times, but had become more of a kind of... Um, pillar of the Latino community. And, and he was just, um, he was covering a demonstration, anti-war demonstration in East Los Angeles and sheriff's deputies shot a canister into the bar where he was, hit him in the head and killed him. And so Thompson goes out to cover that story. And while he's in Los Angeles, he gets another offer to cover a different story, a road race just outside the, uh, Las Vegas in the, in the Nevada desert. So he decides to invite Oscar Acosta. They go for a weekend. They, he covers the race. Of course, they carry on like crazy. They party furiously. He comes back. He submits his copy to Sports Illustrated, the magazine that wants to run this story. They reject it, partly because it was 10 times longer than what they asked for. And he's, you know, pretty irate about that, but he, what he decides to do is send it to Rolling Stone where he has this connection now and uh, they love it. So in fact, he goes back for another weekend with Acosta and this time they get Ralph Steadman to do the illustrations. And that turns into this book, his second, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. And you can see the illustration on the front cover, which establishes the kind of distinctive iconography of gonzo journalism. That's Thompson, of course, at the wheel. And that's, I mean, it's, it's actually Raul Duke, his alter ego. And, um, and of course, the, his passenger there is not Oscar Acosta, but a character named Dr. Gonzo. It's very lightly kind of fictionalized description of their two trips, two, two weekends, in, in Las Vegas, but it is fictionalized. I mean, that's the important thing to, to remember. Um, yes, both men went there, but, but in the book, in the, in the original Rolling Stone story, neither of them is identified by name. They have these fictional characters essentially. And we know that some of it was fiction, including the drug stash that Raul Duke lovingly describes in the, in the first part of the book as they're racing across the desert from Los Angeles to, to Las Vegas. So this is another kind of comic masterpiece um, and it really etches gonzo journalism in, in the public imagination. And now he's really sort of at the top of his game. He's writing for this fledgling rock magazine. Um, he's reaching a lot of readers, mostly young people. And um, they love his kind of iconoclastic countercultural approach to, to his topics. On the strength of that book, uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, Rolling Stone decides to take to, um, you know, to pursue a really radical experiment in some ways. It didn't seem so crazy at the time. But now in retrospect, especially, it, it seems very odd indeed. But what Jan Wenner and Hunter S. Thompson decide to do is have Thompson cover the 1972 presidential campaign. Now, he had done some political reporting, but 
but he had never covered an entire campaign in this way. And you know, the people who do that are professionals, right? They, that's what they do. And they represent all these important news organizations like the New York Times and the Washington Post, all the uh, television networks and so on. So, and then there's a kind of whole culture, journalistic culture that specializes in that. And Thompson is really looking forward to doing this. And he agrees to take this assignment and he goes and covers the entire 1972 presidential campaign full-time. That's all he writes about in the year 1972. And in many ways, you know, he has a lot to overcome. You know, he doesn't represent a big well-known news organization. He represents this five-year-old rock magazine from San Francisco that writes about, you know, the Grateful Dead and, you know, where the good dope is coming from. So it's not really clear that this is going to be, a, uh, you know, the conditions for success that Thompson hopes it will be. But in fact, he decides to turn those liabilities into assets by going directly for what he considers the unvarnished truth about the campaign. Instead of, you know, playing by the rules of objective journalism, he's just going to do what he always does and not only cover the situation that he's observing, but also tell you and remark on and critique the coverage of the other places. So, so his coverage really looks both ways to, to the campaign and also to the, the media, mainstream media's inability to, to tell the truth about it, which he purports to do. Now, of course, his audience is young people and um, they're gonna welcome this. You know, they, there's no love lost between the counterculture and the establishment at this time for a variety of reasons. Richard Nixon is president. Um, there's been a war in Vietnam for a long time. There's a draft, um, you know, civil rights. There's all kinds of things that young people um, are unhappy about. And, you know, Thompson taps that. And, um, but he, even as he's covering this all important 1972 presidential campaign. Another thing that distinguishes his coverage is he makes no bones about his preference, who is this man that he's talking to here, George McGovern, who's not even the front runner for the Democratic Party nomination. He's maybe third behind Edmund Muskie and Hubert Humphrey. So the first thing that Thompson does is he goes directly at Humphrey and Muskie, just belittling them, you know, calling them names. It's hilarious, of course, but it's, it's also pretty over the top, considering that these are some of the most powerful politicians in the country at the time. And normally you would be, you know, a, you think, oh, it's a left wing or liberal magazine it's probably gonna to try to make the democratic candidates look good. And in, in a sense, that is what Thompson did, but he didn't go for the front runners. He, he, he is, he's got them in his periscopes, in fact, and he detests Richard Nixon, who is the Republican nominee. So the first thing he does is go after Muskie, then he goes after Humphrey. All the while he's um, touting McGovern as a superior candidate, a superior person. And uh, then he goes after Nixon, and then it gets really crazy. In fact, after Nixon wins in 1972, November, Thompson does nothing to try to mask his disappointment. And in fact, just a few days after a landslide victory on Nixon's part, um, Thompson compares him to a werewolf. You know, there's a werewolf living in the White House right now. And that may not seem like powerful stuff now, and of course, you'd have to read it in context to, to get the kind of comic precision that Thompson brings to it. But it's an extraordinary act of journalism um, at that time. And it's, it's also ex remarkably successful. And of course, then he turns that into a book. He takes, he resists the urge to turn it into a kind of tidy narrative. And instead, what he does is um, produces what he calls his campaign, a uh, jangled campaign diary, uh, very immediate, very raw, produced in difficult circumstances at the last second sometimes. Uh, you know, it includes hallucinations. You know, he's, he's a little bit revved up on the dexedrine that he takes to 
to help him stay focused. He's and um, you know sometimes you just think, man, this guy needs to cut back on the speed a little bit. But um, it turns out to be the most memorable and maybe the most durable account of the 1972 presidential campaign. In fact, one of uh, McGovern's campaign advisors calls uh, Thompson's reporting the least factual and most accurate description of the campaign. And that really kind of summarizes both Thompson's achievement, but also how he worked very close to the knuckle, but also sort of fantastically. You know, he, he tried to get at the truth the way a novelist would, not, not the way an objective journalist would. And that puts him in a position to say things that those objective journalists know are true, but have trouble smuggling or putting across in the um, typical kind of hard news campaign format. So on the strength of that and, 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 and the, the work that he does after this for Rolling Stone, Thompson becomes a cultural celebrity. Um, his writing becomes more difficult um, and we can talk about that if you like, um, but in that decade between 1965 and 1975, Thompson produces these three books, Hell's Angels, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail 72 that have really sort of locked him in to uh, a place of honor really in, a, in American letters. And that's why, as I said at the top of the program, um, he might be the most distinctive American voice in the second half of the 20th century. And with that, um, I'll go ahead and pull my, my um, photographs down and we can discuss uh, what I talked about or anything else that's on your mind about um, Hunter Thompson and his work. That was awesome. Really, really fascinating stuff. I'm so glad that you included the images as well. Um, to all of you out there, yes, we have plenty of time for questions and comments, so feel free to get yours in under the Q&A icon. But I was interested in your writing process and was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you did your research and, and you know, who, how you came up with all of this, these images and, and all of um, the historical information. Yeah, well, I mean, it comes out of my teaching at San Francisco State, and, and Thompson had been a, a kind of secondary character in the three books I wrote before this. One was about Kerry McWilliams, who was his editor on the Hells Angels piece at The Nation. Remarkable guy. I mean, you know, we could do a whole, a whole thing on, on Kerry McWilliams, uh, who doesn't get enough attention. He really was an outstanding, versatile, public intellectual who was in producing almost a book of a book a year in Los Angeles throughout the 1940s and was you know Thompson certainly knew who he was and was always considered it an honor to write for Kerry McWilliams and kept in touch with him after he wrote for the nation so I wrote a book about that I wrote a book about uh, Ramparts magazine which Warren Hinkle edited we saw a picture of Warren there and, and Thompson was in that book as well. And then you mentioned in my introduction that I wrote a book about the Grateful Dead. Thompson was a huge Grateful Dead fan. And, and later in life, he looked back on his years in San Francisco and said, those were my peak years. You know, that was a peak era for me. Um, and he didn't say this, but I think, uh, I think it, it, it's demonstrably true that it really was that time and place, San Francisco in the mid 1960s, that allowed him to become the kind of writer that he became. Yes, he moves away shortly after that, but I don't think he could have become Hunter Thompson, you know, rock star journalist, if he um, had been anywhere else, had been in New York or Los Angeles or Miami or Louisville or you know Puerto Rico, or or even if he had been in San Francisco ten years earlier or ten years later. I mean, it was just that confluence of of events and people and social energy and artistic energy. And, you know, he sort of rose with 
Rolling Stone magazine, which was founded right. at almost exactly the same time. So there was just a, this kind of fine flash of a moment there where he was able to um, connect with all these larger um, you know, literary and journalistic and social forces and become this um, important figure. Now, as far as the research, it was tough. Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of the archives were closed. Um, you know, uh, there have been a lot of interviews already. So I spent a lot of time just kind of scouring the secondary literature. Um, there were some, some things that are rather less known that I thought were important and hadn't been given proper attention especially the period and place that I was just talking about. And I mean, you know, that was part of my claim for the book was that, he, you know, that in, in many ways, Thompson was a Bay Area author in ways that hadn't been acknowledged. But, you know, there's still the telephone. Everybody was home, you know, during COVID. I mean, if they were alive, you could get them on the telephone, hopefully. And I got some great help along the way from the people that I interviewed and the People that I read, Jan Wenner, of course, has done so much work to make Thompson an important figure. A lot of other people who work for Rolling Stone were around. And I really, I should have mentioned this earlier, although you might have inferred it from the talk that I gave, I really focused on his editors. I really wanted to talk yeah. to the people who helped Thompson become himself because he really benefited from some really fine editors and editorial support. And over the course of his career, especially after the period that we focused on tonight, he really needed that help. And um, I mean, you know, he was a kind of um, superstar by that time. And so a lot of places, not just Rolling Stone, but especially Rolling Stone, were able to kind of support him with all kinds of um, editorial support. And of course, he, all, he lived in the Rocky Mountains for the entire time. So, you know, he wasn't just across town and, you know, come on in the office and let's work on this. Uh, you know, it was the begin early days of the uh, of the fax machine, and he was kind of faxing stuff in, and what he called the Mojo Wire. <laughs> so I talked to a lot of his editors and 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 tried to make sure that people understood that in addition to working with Stedman, the illustrator, who's a super important part of the success, he also benefited from from um, being in San Francisco and also working with these super talented editors. That's so interesting. Thanks a lot for elaborating on that. Um, you talked about, you know, including some of the unknown facts. What was the most surprising thing that you learned? Yeah, well, I think one of the things certainly was even after he invented gonzo journalism with the Kentucky Derby piece, and even after the um, Las Vegas piece, he didn't really understand that gonzo, this kind of strain of his work, um, was his most valuable literary asset, that he was always a freelancer. He was always looking to figure out, you know, where the next check was coming from. As sharp as he was and as savvy as he was, he didn't really totally get right away that the success of Gonzo was going to dwarf all of his other, um, all of his other work, even, even in some ways, the Hells Angels work, which was a great work of new uh -huh. journalism. So, and what he was worried about was um, losing his credibility by basically writing in this kind of comic mode, which, which Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas certainly was. But the funny thing about that is in all of his gonzo work, certainly his best gonzo work, yes, it's funny. Yes, it's satirical. Yes, it's over the top. But there's always a kind of political backdrop that he sets the crazy action against that helps us understand the times that he was writing in. And it also helps us understand one other thing that I don't think, maybe this is another thing that you have to think about a little bit. And I thought about it over the course of writing the book is that there's this theme of lunacy in Thompson's work. You know, these kind of crazy situations that he finds himself in. <laughs> Half of them he creates himself <laughs> and then reports on them. but What's really crazy is what was going on politically at the time in the yeah. mainstream culture. You know, so people, you know, were used to dismissing the counterculture at this time, you know, crazy kids and kooks and, you know, they're 
smoking the wacky tobacco and you know everything was just kind of um dismissed and made fun of and and they were sort of infantilized during this time and really from the counterculture's point of view to the typical rolling stone readers point of view it was people like richard nixon who are crazy right and we know now from from seeing the the uh what uh, Nixon talked about it in the White House, not only what he talked about it, but how he talked about it. Mm-hmm. It was really pretty incredibly insane mm-hmm. um, what 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 he was saying and how he was saying it. So, you know, Thompson was right. I mean, it seemed hyperbolic and over the top, um, but it, and comical. But in many ways, it turned out to be prophetic. And it's only now, fifty years later that some political scientists, for example, are saying, you know who predicted the rise of Donald Trump? Hunter S. Thompson, 50 years ago, when he was writing about the Hells Angels. Uh, That's so incredible. You know, I wanted to ask you along those lines, what do you think Hunter S. Thompson would say about today, Donald Trump? I mean, I know it's, there's a lot of different kind of, things at at work here but (laughs) yeah I don't think I don't think Trump would have surprised him and I don't think his Trump supporters would have surprised him and I don't think the media's reaction to Trump would have surprised him in fact if you look back over his body of work he was basically warning us about all of that um, from the from the moment he began to write seriously I mean his theme as he as he was happy to tell anybody who asked you know, what is, it, what is it that you're, what's your big idea? And he would say the death of the American dream. And, you know, that was a hard thing to write about directly. He really struggled with it actually. But when you look back on his work, both the campaign coverage, you know, uh, Kentucky Derby, Las Vegas, really the thing that's propelling him is his critique of what modern America was becoming and modern American politics, especially. He doesn't really focus on politics until after 1968, he attends the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Uh, Until that time he's writing about, you know, the Hells Angels and other kind of exotic provincial subcultures. Um, He sees that he can do that um, after he sees the success of uh, Tom Wolfe who comes out from New York and writes about Ken Kesey, who was a friend of Thompson's, and so on. So he says, I could do that too. So that's what he's doing until 1968, after he witnesses this police riot as people are protesting the war in Vietnam at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. He's, I'm gonna write about politics. And he begins to target the political class directly. Um, and as I say, not just Richard Nixon, though he saves his most powerful stuff for Nixon, but even you know some of the Democrats, especially the pro-war Democrats. And then there's no love lost between him and Mayor Richard Daly of Chicago, right? Who he holds responsible for what the police did to, to protesters and even observers and innocent bystanders in Chicago uh, in 1968, all of which was photographed and filmed so interesting you know his perspective is so fundamentally unique the whole gonzo journalism is i just have so much admiration for him yes very difficult to sustain that that's the thing is that and and his his friends noticed this that in some ways nobody could imitate him because only he could live the way that he lived which was just stomping on his accelerator full full blast most of the time i mean he would retreat and sort of, you know, um, you know, f- find the find the little rest in in uh, his cabin in Woody Creek on this property that he bought in the Rocky Mountains. But, you know, he was not one to sit idle for very long. And of course, his his um, you know, there's there's a there's a strong uh, there's a lot of attention that goes into drug consumption. Mm-hmm. In, it, in his work. And of course, that was something that the, that the counterculture was interested in. The readers of Rolling Stone were interested in. It was part of his satire. And in many ways, he, you know, he, he built this persona, which, you know, his real life did not really match the persona, but people kind of expected yeah. him to play the person that he projected 
in his work, sometimes under, a, uh, under an alter ego like Raoul Duke, but when he arrived on the scene, they expected the full, full blown show. And, you know, after a while, he just, you know, more and more started, started to do that, to sort of match that expectation. And he comes back to San Francisco in the 1980s. And, um, you know, he's kind of hanging out at, uh, with the Mitchell brothers at the O'Farrell Theater, which he described as the, um, um, what did he call it? The um, uh, Carnegie, uh, Carnegie Hall of Public oh. Sex in America. <laughs> and, you know, he says, I'm the, you know, names himself the night manager. He's going to write about that. He never really does. And over time, we didn't talk about this much, but after the 1970s, he, he, the book royalties become a more important part of his, of his revenue. Um, but the books are not, they're not really as good as the ones that came before, but he's, he's reaching larger and larger audiences. He has this incredible persona. And then Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas gets turned into a Hollywood movie, actually two Hollywood movies, the second one with Johnny Depp. And so he has, he continues to kind of burnish his legend and has this kind of rock star celebrity, even though his work is, you know, is kind of slacking off a little bit, both in quality and the quantity, but, but he's able to kind of sustain that um, until his death in 2005 at, at, at age 67. This has just been so fascinating. I, I really appreciate it. And yes, there's a couple questions. Of course, this is being recorded. You will all receive a link to it tomorrow. You don't have to retain it all tonight. <laughs> um, to sort of switch gears, are you working on anything now? I have a couple of things in mind, yes. One of them is a little bit delicate. It's connected to this. Um, you know, once you sort of get onto something, a lot of times one thing leads to another. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's, it's too soon probably to talk about that. Okay. Um, and I have another idea for a book that's actually set in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to figure out which of those two projects to, to dip into next. And, um, you know, it's nice to have the teaching because yes. um, you're always kind of working on presenting material to students and, and trying to motivate some interest in that material. And, I, did um, share, oh, I, I just mentioned, I did share your previous titles um, about the Grateful Dead and about Ramparts Magazine. So people can take a look and, and get those get their hands on those copies as well. Yeah, and those are all, you know, you'll see the connections once you, uh, if you decide to look at those. And, you know, one of the things that I think is, is easy to do, especially 50 years after 60 almost, uh, what was happening in San Francisco in the 1960s, is, um, you know, it turns into kind of a cartoon, you know, the, the hippies become kind of cartoon characters. And many of these, these last three books, uh, Ramparts Magazine, Grateful Dead, and now um, Hunter S. Thompson, is really kind of an attempt to, to say, you know, yeah, um, it was a remarkable time. It was a memorable time, but there's some achievement here, you know, and it, it tends to get glossed over in favor of the, in favor of the kind of um, cartoon or stereotype. And, you know, counterculture, you know, did not stop in 1969 or 1970. It sort of spread out over the second half of the 20th century and, and was very deeply, deeply formative of American culture and politics to some extent, although I think culturally it was even more important. And, you know, it's worth saying, um, if you look around an American city today, you're gonna see a lot of stuff that wouldn't be there if it weren't for the counterculture. You know, you're not gonna have yoga studios, and right. cannabis dispensaries, yeah. and, farmers markets and recycling centers and all that stuff, you know, and, and more um, if it weren't for the counterculture that the, the mainstream culture just easily absorbed all of that. Um, and Peter Coyote, who was there yeah. in San Francisco used to, likes to say, doesn't he live in Sebastopol now? I think he might. Yeah. But he, um, he would say, you know, we lost all the political battles and won all the cultural ones. And, you know, there's something to that. And, and one more thing about uh, Jerry Garcia, the lead guitarist of um, The Grateful Dead, he said about San Francisco 
during that time. He said, we, we sort of dropped a pebble into the middle of the pond. And once we did, you couldn't stop the ripple effect. You know, it was unstoppable in many ways. Now that didn't mean, you know, that everything was inevitable or that, right. or that, you know, there was going to be some kind of glorious political victory at the end of it. But there are ways that what happened during that time kind of rippled out. And, and, and Thompson and his work is one example of that. Absolutely. We do have a quick question here from John. Um, he's wondering what happened to Thompson's political coverage after his backing of Jimmy Carter in 1976, which seemed wholehearted. Yes, that was his last kind of important um, contribution to, to, uh, to political journalism in some ways. I mean, where he was on the ground reporting. Um, he, was, he was a huge supporter of Jimmy Carter and like McGovern, Thompson's support really mattered for a certain segment of, of, of the population. And he was really impressed by Jimmy Carter as he was by uh, McGovern. He really doesn't write that much about the 1980 campaign. You would think that, that Reagan would get his juices going, but it didn't really. I mean, he did critique humorously, and, but not quite as savagely uh, Reagan, who was, the, turned out to be the more important figure. I mean, Nixon was a very, very important political figure. I would say those two, Reagan and then Nixon, were the two most important American politicians in the second half of the 20th century, both California, both come out of Southern California. Um, 1984, he's at the Democratic National Convention in San Francisco, but he, he doesn't submit any, any copy. You know, And that's really the last convention that he goes to, he, he, he covers from home, he covers um, Bill Clinton, oh. who he didn't love. Oh. And, uh, and he wrote a lot about uh, George W. Bush, mostly the son. In fact, the last really great thing that he wrote was on September 12th, 2001, the day after 9-11. Oh. He writes and he's struggling with his health. I mean, he's having a hard time completing his, even his columns much less his books, but he um, writes a really prophetic piece about what's gonna happen after the attack on the World Trade Center in the Pentagon. And it turned out to be incredibly insightful and it was instant, it was the day after. So he maintained his acuity, he was still very sharp. And even though his work suffered over the last couple of decades of his, of his career, he was still capable of some really remarkable insights. And I would, I would urge people to read that piece. It appeared on ESPN. Really? He was, he was writing for online for ESPN, which shows you how kaleidoscopic the national media had become. At that I just time. made a note. I'm going to definitely try and find that and maybe I'll in include it in the follow-up email tomorrow because that sounds fantastic. Yeah, they also quote it in uh, Gonzo, the, the, uh, which I recommend, which is Alex Gibney's um, documentary film about Hunter S. Thompson. I think Johnny Depp reads that part and, and others. You know, Depp, of course, becomes a big friend of, of, um, of Hunter Thompson. You talked about the research. Depp and others own a kind of consortium, own Hunter Thompson's papers, which really? are stored in a, they're in a storage facility right now and not really available to researchers. I was not able to look at them. And I think Hunter Thompson's son, Juan, when he wrote his book, I think only visited that once himself. So, you know, we'll see how that works out. I mean, yeah. maybe, maybe those papers will be made available to researchers and there'll be a whole new trove of research materials that, you know, will help us understand Thompson and his work uh, even better. Let's hope that would be incredible treasure chest. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Well, thank you so much, Peter. This has been such an awesome hour. I really, really enjoyed it. And we're getting lots of positive feedback here, thanking you for, for this wonderful event. And as I mentioned, yes, this is being recorded. Everyone will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording and I'll find the article. Maybe I can find a link to the movie Gonzo and um, previous titles by Peter as well. I bet it's lovely to take your counterculture course. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> well, yeah, I invited my students. I'm not sure, I was a little late maybe. And I'm not sure I'm anywhere able to make it, but but I will post it and, and yeah. we'll see if they, if they uh, we are going to read Hunter S. Thompson 
later in the semester along with John Didion. So, so it should be fun. Yeah. Great. Thanks for having me. Jane. Oh, it means a lot to me. Of course, anytime. Well, thanks so much. And uh, when you get the new book out, maybe we'll get you in person. Let's hope. Be even better. Okay. Thank you again. Yeah, have a great evening. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye.